hour long recording. Okay. All right. So we're ready? Yep. Okay. Thank you all for coming today. I would like to introduce Ryan Choi, a PhD candidate in WILD who will be defending his PhD dissertation entitled Climate Driven Impacts of Warming and Grazing on Subarctic Coastal Wetlands in Alaska. Ryan has his MS degree from Utah State University, which many of you might know him from that, and his undergraduate degree from Whitman College. Um, and just a note that his undergrad advisor is actually on the call, which is pretty impressive. Um, while, yet, uh, while at USU, Ryan has published 11 manuscripts and is first author on three of these, two of which are his dissertation chapters that he'll be presenting today and another from his MS research. He has TA'd seven courses at USU and has been a co-author on many professional presentations of which he was the first author on five. While a graduate student, he also received several prestigious research awards, including a Climate Adaptation Science Fellowship, a USU Presidential Doctoral Research Fellowship, a USU Dissertation Enhancement Award, and a Quinney Master's Fellowship. I have known Ryan since 2008, when he started working with me on his MS degree in Hawaii. After his MS degree in 2013, I asked Ryan to come back to USU and work on a PhD on an exciting new research project that I had going in Alaska. I knew Ryan had worked on both um, in Alaska previously and that he would be up for the many challenges of working in a remote research camp. As Ryan will describe today, this research focused on long distance bird migration. And I remember once during our first year at the field camp, Ryan said to me how he related to these birds and the long journey they take each year. As many of you probably know, Ryan is a through hiker and thus long journeys are a running theme in his life. Ryan, I'm very glad to see you're completing this journey. Ryan will give about a 45 minutes to an hour long presentation after which there will be time for questions by the general public. I ask that the committee hold questions until after that when we have time during the defense. Um, without further ado, I introduce Ryan. Um, thank you for that introduction, Karen. And it's, um, yeah, it's great to be here and it's great to see so many uh, awesome faces from so many different chapters of my life. And I'm really excited to talk to you guys about what I've been doing for the last uh, several years. So uh, first I would like to acknowledge that this work was conducted on the traditional living lands of the indigenous Chupik people who still love out, live out here in the Yukon Delta. And this work would not have been possible without them. Um, I'd also like to thank my generous funding sources that supported this work and my time as a graduate student. So as we transition into spring this week, uh, it's a good time to think about the importance of timing of biological activity. And I'll pre present some background on um, climate-driven phenological mismatch. Um, I will then discuss the three dissertation chapters um, of my work addressing the effects of mismatch on plant traits, soil nitrogen, and plant communities. And lastly, I will conclude with uh, some overall thoughts and findings from our work. So anthropogenic climate change is rapidly warming Arctic regions. And on average, temperatures have increased uh, nearly two degrees Celsius at rates twice as fast as at lowered latitudes. Um, Subarctic regions are experiencing the greatest effects and earlier springs and uh, warmer temperatures are altering the timing of biotic interactions. Now, this shift in timing is known as phenological mismatch, and phenology in this case uh, refers to the timing of biological activities. So phenological mismatch occurs when the timing of two species at different trophic levels are out of sync with one another, uh, often occurring between producers and consumers. Um, this can be a problem for species that have co-evolved to rely on one another, but are occurring at different times. Uh, mismatch in the timing of these behaviors have the potential to restructure communities alter resource availability and affect ecosystem processes. There are several prominent examples of phenological mismatch um, in the literature. Uh, for example, caribou and vegetation uh, mismatch occurring in Greenland, um, migratory great tits and the timing of insect emergence in Europe, uh, grizzly bears and the timing of migratory salmon runs in Alaska, and pollinators and floral emergence uh, globally, occurring globally. Uh, 
however, due to the diversity of different taxa and these global responses, it's difficult to develop an ecological yardstick of this uh, climate-driven change. Migratory birds are particularly vulnerable to phenological mismatch due to the different rates of change in their winter and summer ranges. And while some species are adapting, others aren't quite keeping up. Migratory behaviors are highly energy intensive and many species track green waves of resources along their migration pathways. However, there's still high likelihood of experiencing mismatch in the timing of resources at different latitudes. The Yukon Delta is the second largest uh, wildlife refuge after the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in Alaska. Uh, it encompasses over 19 million acres of coastal wetlands and is equivalent in size to the state of South Carolina. Um, at 61 degrees north, it's a subarctic ecosystem and the southernmost extent of Alaskan tundra. Um, it also uh, has a very low coastal gradient as, and is very flat uh, throughout the majority of, of, of the refuge. The Yukon Delta is critical habitat for millions of migratory birds, and species travel thousands of miles annually to nest and rear their young. Uh, and some species like bar-tailed godwits and arctic terns uh, migrate as far away as New Zealand and Antarctica uh, for the summer season, some making uh, round trips close to 10,000 miles. In arctic coastal wetlands, long-distance migratory geese are the primary herbivores. And in the YK Delta, we have four different goose species that utilize the prominent uh, coastal habitats during the growing season. Uh, we have uh, emperor geese, uh, cackling geese, uh, Pacific black brant, and greater white-fronted geese. Our research focuses on the effects on uh, Pacific black brant. Uh, these geese nest in high-density colonies along the coastal margin uh, to rear their goslings and to put on fat stores in preparation for their fall migration. Uh, black rants spend their winters in coastal estuaries in Baja, California, and then in the spring they fly 3,000 miles to their breeding grounds all the way up in the Yukon Delta, stopping, stopping along the way to refuel. Uh, because brant are what are known as income breeders uh, that require refueling along their migration route as opposed to arriving at, their, at the breeding grounds with all of their energy stores, uh, they're limited by the rate of green up along the flyway, which controls the rate they can adapt to changing conditions at the breeding grounds. Brant migrate to the Del what, Yukon Delta to feed on Carrick Subspath AC, a grazing lawn seen here. And these lawns are high in nitrogen content and easily digestible protein used for growth and mulch regeneration. Brant optimize the timing of their migration to maximize gosling growth. And typical gosling hatch occurs around June 20th. Um, and there's a narrow window for goslings to fully develop in time for fall migration. Um, and there's a direct correlation between forage quality and gosling survival. Geese have a dynamic feedback with a uh, re relationship with these carex grazing lawns. Uh, goose grazing maintains short stature lawns of these near monoculture sedges high in nutrient content. And in the absence of grazing, these lawns will revert to a taller, less nutritious growth form uh, known as uh, carex romenskii. And although these are identified as two different species, they're actually different growth forms of the same plant. Uh, field experiments by Brian Person found that uh, simulated grazing can convert Carex romenskii into Carex subspathacea, while excluding geese can return it back to the taller, less nutritious romenskii. Uh, research by Jim Sedinger has found that brant populations are highly dependent on grazing lawns, and over the last 20 years, black brant populations have declined due to reductions in grazing lawn habitat on the landscape. While there's interannual variability in the timing of spring, uh, the long-term trend is advancing approximately 2.2 days per decade, uh, which means that spring is occurring earlier in the Yukon Delta. While Brant do seem to be tracking spring green up with earlier hatch dates, it's still not occurring as fast as the rate of green up. Um, of the four primary goose species, they're the smallest and presumably the most affected by change due to, the, due to their inability to store more energy. The Yukon Delta is predicted to have warmer temperatures in the future. Um, by the end of the century, models predict a 3.5 uh, Celsius degree um, increase in spring and a 2.5 Celsius increase in summer temperatures. And greater warming in the spring during time of migratory arrival uh, can have critical impacts on reproductive success. So the timing of migratory behaviors are often synchronized to maximize uh, resource availability. For example, with Arctic migratory geese, uh, 
the timing of nesting has evolved to coincide with the period of highest forage quality for goslings at time of hatch. So if this x-axis is uh, time and day of year, um, our y-axis is the abundance of geese or the quality of their forage. And geese are highly sensitive to forage quality and shifts in timing and availability, um, which can negatively impact goslin growth and survival. Now, because of the climate change, species are likely to experience asynchronous cues uh, along initiating their migration. Uh, for example, spring conditions are, are becoming warmer compared to the fixed photo period and day length um, in the spring. And because of these differences, migratory herbivores can arrive either early or late relative to producers, which would result in phenological mismatch between consumers and their resources. Uh, similarly, advanced growing seasons are resulting in earlier plant growth. And if consumers continue to arrive on time relative to historic uh, patterns, they will, will arrive late relative to their resources, resulting in phenological mismatch. However, if migratory species are able to cue into these changes, this could result in species keeping up with phenological shifts. Alternatively, there's the potential for late or delayed arrival, which would result in greater mismatch and even less overlap with their resources. And if herbivores fail to keep up, uh, shifts in the timing can potentially result in population declines. Uh, while many studies and meta-analyses meta have identified phenological mismatch in the literature, uh, few have focused on the consequences of these interactions. Uh, a recent paper by Beard et al. Uh, highlighted the missing angle and importance of using uh, manipulative experiments to investigate eco ecosystem consequences of mismatch. And in this paper, they identified five key points. First, it's important to research systems where phenological data exist, where there's a historic uh, baseline of comparison. Two, it's important to identify species with seasonality uh, and species that are affected by climate change. Um, and the producer must directly affect the survival of the consumer. Uh, it's important to focus on key species impacts, um, uh, especially in ecosystems with few primary species to isolate uh, the effects of these, of these interactions. It's important to design multi-year experiments that alter the timing of two species at different trophic levels. And lastly, uh, it's important to measure ecosystem responses under both uh, current and future scenarios. So the Kent central case study in this important paper was based on data from my first two dissertation chapters. Uh, we conducted a three-year manipulative field experiment to answer these first two questions. Uh, how does phenological mismatch uh, affect plant traits? And how does phenological mismatch affect soil nitrogen? And for my last chapter, I conducted a separate two-year uh, manipulative field experiment to answer my final question. Uh, how does mismatch between herbivores um, and and plants uh, affect plant communities. So in the first experiment, we controlled the timing of spring green up and the timing of goose grazing. And we had eight experimental plots that resulted in different phenological mismatch scenarios. Season advancement advanced the growing season by about three weeks, while ambient plots uh, had no relative change in timing. Grazing treatments also resulted in a similar shift in timing with early grazing simulating early goose arrival by about three weeks. Um, typical grazing simulated no relative change. And late grazing simulated uh, delayed arrival by about three weeks. And we also simulated no goose arrival to the Yukon Delta in case geese change their migration behaviors and fail to arrive altogether. These treatments combined resulted in mismatch scenarios uh, with differing degrees of change, varying from uh, three weeks advanced to six weeks delayed. And our treatment comparison were the plots that had ambient spring green up and typical goose uh, grazing as our control comparison. We used open top chambers uh, that were used to passively warm plots in advance the timing of spring. And we placed these OTCs on plots on May, around May 30th and then removed them on July 1st. And just to note, this wasn't a warming experiment. Um, instead, we just used these chambers to uh, alter the timing of, of spring green up. We caught wild female black brant on their nests uh, using bonnet traps. And then we clipped their wings and kept a flock of about two dozen geese in captivity over the summer to use in grazing treatments. We transported birds in dog kennels and moved them around to our experimental plots to graze at specified times. 
And grazing treatments were conducted for about 24 hours every 12 days, uh, four times over about five weeks. And during these grazing trials, we allowed geese, geese to graze, trample, and defecate in our experimental plots. So black brant typically arrive to the breeding grounds around the end of May. Uh, they then initiate their nests and undergo a three-week incubation period on their eggs. Uh, then uh, goslings begin to hatch on the landscape um, around June 20th. And then after hatch, both adults and goslings undergo a period of intensive grazing to put on energy stores in preparation for fall migration. Our grazing treatments were staggered at three-week intervals to simulate periods of early, typical, and late grazing. And these treatments were the same intensity and duration and only differed in the timing of grazing initiation. Uh, these are photos depicting our grazing treatments in early, typical, late, and no grazing plots. And just a reminder that our typical grazing was our uh, comparison treatment. So my first dissertation chapter focuses on how phenological mismatch affects plant traits of a goose forage species. And this manuscript was published uh, in Journal of Ecology in 2019. Uh, climate change can alter the timing of the growing season as well as the timing of migration and uh, has the potential to result in phenological mismatch for both producers and consumers. Now, historically, most studies have focused entirely on the effects of consumers, focusing on things like population size and reproductive success. However, it's also important to understand how developing mismatches affect species at lower trophic levels. And to the best of our knowledge, uh, no one has focused on the effects of mismatch on producers and the implications for consumers. So uh, like we mentioned before, climate change is, is advancing the start of the growing season in northern latitudes. And many species produce early season above and below ground growth in response uh, to these changing conditions. Um, resulting in increased, gro increased growth um, with taller plants and shifts in reproductive output. There are only a handful of studies focusing on the timing of herbivorian Arctic systems. And most of these studies focus on, on either the intensity or the frequency in grazing and not the timing. Um, early grazing is likely to reduce biomass and plant traits earlier in the season, while late grazing is likely to have the opposite effects on vegetation. So we had three hypotheses for this experiment. First, we expect timing of grazing to affect plant biomass and plant traits because we know that geese have dynamic feedbacks with their forage. Uh, we predict that early grazing and late grazing uh, to have opposing responses to one another, either reducing or increasing productivity earlier or later in the season. Our second hypothesis is that we expect earlier growing seasons to result in greater biomass and taller plants earlier in the season because warming results in greater earlier plant productivity. And lastly, our third hypothesis is that we expect timing of grazing and season to interact with one another. Um, and because early grazing and uh, season advancement have opposing effects, um, it's possible that grazing can mitigate shifts resulting from uh, climate-driven mismatch and earlier green up. So we conducted a three-year uh, manipulative field experiment where we controlled the timing of green up and the timing of goose grazing that resulted in different mismatch scenarios. So each season we collected an array of biomass and plant trait measurements. Uh, we measured stem heights on a weekly basis. Uh, we collect live, collected live and dead biomass five times over the growing season, as well as the number of inflorescences in each of these uh, quadrats. And then we collected um, root biomass to determine a season long below ground uh, productivity at the end of the season. We use linear mi mixed effect models uh, in Delta AIC model comparison to identify our best fit models. And we treated uh, season and grazing as fixed effects and plot nested in block as random effects. Uh, our data were log transformed and we include an error one autocorrelation function in our models. Uh, open top chambers effectively increased vegetation heights by the time they were removed on July 1st. Uh, growth rates from our stem height measurements indicate that the season was advanced by about three weeks each year of the experiment. So we were successfully able to advance the growing season using this treatment. Uh, we also found that both timing of grazing and season advancement affected plant traits. We found that early grazing uh, decreased biomass and stem heights resulting in reduced goose forage availability. 
while in contrast, no goose arrival increased biomass and stem heights, uh, resulting in taller, more abundant forage. Season advancement resulted in taller stem heights, but not uh, greater biomass, which is similar to uh, other Arctic warming studies in the literature. Season advancement also resulted in greater dead biomass and inflorescencies, um, which was surprising given that Carexospathacea doesn't produce uh, biomass, or sorry, it doesn't produce dead biomass. It's generally just uh, living above ground tissue. Comparatively, uh, late and no grazing also increased dead biomass and inflorescencies, so removal uh, similar to season advancement, but these effects were either five or 17 times greater um, than that of season advancement. Additionally, some of the, many of these effects on dead biomass and inflorescencies were not seen until the second or the third year of our experiment. So there was this delayed response uh, by plants to our treatments. Um, and although grazing directly affected above ground biomass, uh, the timing of goose grazing also had below ground effects. Early grazing by geese reduced root biomass by about 55%. And we also saw an increase, general increase in trend with delayed goose arrival due to greater above ground biomass and presumed uh, root foraging in the soil. Uh, no goose grazing initially resulted in the greatest uh, root biomass in year one. However, by year three, this trend actually reversed and resulted in an overall decrease uh, in reduction in, in below ground productivity. Um, so just to recap, early grazing reduced above ground and, and below ground biomass uh, and stem heights, which reduced overall forage for geese. While both late grazing and season advancement resulted in, um, had similar effects and also resulted in three week shifts of mismatch and had similar effects to one another um, on these traits. Um, we also saw this production of inflorescencies with late grazing and season advancement, uh, which was surprising given that uh, generally reproduces uh, asexually and clonally um, as opposed to through uh, sexual reproduction. And lastly, no goose grazing resulted in taller plants, uh, an increase in above and below ground biomass, or sorry, above ground bi biomass and dead biomass, uh, and delayed shifts in reproduction and root biomass. When we think about these effects from a mismatch uh, perspective, um, we saw a three-week shift in advancement where no mismatch resulted in a reduction in above and below ground biomass, while a, a three to six week delay in mismatch resulted in greater live or dead biomass and the production of inflorescencies. Um, so another paper from our experiment investigated the effect of phenological mismatch on forage quality, uh, specifically looking at foliar carbon nitrogen ratios. And lower carbon nitrogen ratios have less cellulose and higher protein content for uh, geese, resulting in higher quality forage. So we found that early grazing maintained high quality forage across the season and reduced carbon nitrogen ratios by about 16%. Uh, in comparison, late and no grazing increased carbon nitrogen ratios by 21 and 41%, uh, resulting in lower overall forage quality. Uh, both typical and late treatments uh, declined in forage quality until the initiation of, of grazing, which are indicated by these arrows here, uh, whereby they were able to maintain but not necessarily improve forage quality for the remainder of the season. Uh, we also found that season advancement does not uh, influence peak timing of forage quality in just the timing of grazing. So early grazing resulted in less available forage for geese on the landscape. Uh, however, geese were able to maintain or increase forage quality with greater digestible foliar nitrogen content. Uh, both late grazing and season advancement resulted in a similar shift in timing and resulted in similar responses by Carex subspathacea. And while some uh, impacts are immediate, other variables may be difficult to predict because some responses uh, took years to respond which suggests the importance of investigating phenological mismatch over multiple seasons. Uh, we also saw an observed shift from clonal to asexual reproduction, um, which has consequences for the genetic diversity of these plants on the landscape and the ability for these uh, plants to adapt to future changes. So in summary, our findings support our first two hypotheses because both timing of grazing and timing of season 
uh, affected plant biomass and vegetation traits. However, we failed to accept our third hypothesis because we did not see any interactive effects between grazing and season advancement. We also didn't see shifts in the timing of the growth of Carexos vaficea, instead only relative percent changes in biomasser traits with shifts in timing for the growing season. So now I'm gonna talk about my second dissertation chapter that focused on how phenological mismatch affects uh, between uh, geese and their forage affects soil nitrogen availability. And this manuscript was published in Ecosystems in 2020. So as we saw in the last chapter, phenological mismatch can impact both producers and consumers. However, there's a knowledge gap in understanding how phenological mismatch between producers and consumers interact to affect biogeochemical cycling. There are only a handful of studies in the literature that have investigated the effects of mismatch on physical processes. And these three papers here investigated changes in carbon flux and greenhouse gas emissions from our experiment. Uh, however, the effects on, on the nitrogen cycle are still unknown. So in the Arctic, nitrogen is a limiting resource uh, due to long winters, uh, colder temperatures, and short growing seasons. And shifts in the timing of trophic interactions between plants and the timing of goose arrival has consequences for nitrogen availability and nutrient cycling in coastal systems. And even subtle shifts in temporal nitrogen availability are important due to the high turnover and ephemeral nature of labile soil nitrogen pools. So season advancement uh, increases both plant biomass and microbial productivity, resulting in larger soil nitrogen pools. So with uh, greater plant biomass, we're likely to see greater litter and um, inputs, uh, organic inputs, which are broken down into organic nitrogen and amino acids. Microbes then break organic nitrogen down into inorganic nitrogen pools of ammonium and nitrate, which can be recycled in the soil with uh, potential uptake by microbes and plants um, within the system, and also potential losses through denitrification and leaching. Uh, herbivores can also alter nitrogen cycling in three ways, either through uh, trampling of vegetation and, and deposition of feces, which will increase turnover and decomposition of organic material. Uh, they also remove biomass through grazing, which has the opposite effect on plant biomass and reducing inputs into this, uh, into this system. So in the last chapter, we saw that early grazing reduced both above and below ground biomass which is likely to result in less uptake by plants and resulting in larger uh, standing so, uh, soil nitrogen pools. While in comparison, late grazing increased above and below ground biomass, which is likely to result in greater nitrogen demand in um, plant uptake and reduced uh, pools in the soil. So we had three hypotheses for this experiment. Uh, because geese can alter plant biomass, we expect timing of grazing to impact soil nitrogen availability. Um, early and late grazing are likely to have opposing effects on soil nitrogen pools, with earlier grazing resulting in larger nitrogen pools and earlier availability, while late grazing could result in smaller pools later in the season. Because we know that earlier growing seasons affect microbial turnover and plant productivity, we expect season advancement to result in larger soil and pools earlier in the season. And lastly, because early grazing and season advancement are predicted to have similar effects, uh, we expect these events will potentially interact resulting in greater soil nitrogen pools earlier in the season. So we use the same three-year manipulative experiment as uh, in chapter one, where we advanced the growing season and altered timing of goose grazing, uh, which resulted in different degrees of phenological mismatch. So we collected several different nitrogen measurements in our plots. Uh, first, we used ion exchange resins seen here in this photo. Uh, and these are resin strips that are ionic, have ionically charged surfaces that passively exchange and bind anions and cations to the surface. So we inserted these resins vertically into the soil at the beginning of the season uh, where they absorbed inorganic uh, ammonium and nitrate in the soil over time and were subsequently pulled at two week intervals to determine season long uh, nitrogen availability. Uh, in the second year of the experiment, we also added these intertidal resins uh, that absorb soil anions and cations between monthly high tide events due to interference from coastal uh, processes. Uh, 
we also use micro lysimeters seen here uh, that um, collected both inorganic and organic nitrogen from interstitial soil poor water. Um, and these measurements were collected every two weeks. Um, we also collected nitrogen mineralization cores uh, that determine the rate of inorganic nitrogen production use ca using KCL extraction uh, from all of our experimental plots. So from these measurements, we used fluorometric microplate assays to determine the concentrations of ammonium, nitrate, and amino acids in each of our different nitrogen measurements. And these reactions uh, here resulted in visible colorimetric responses that were analyzable with a 96 well plate uh, microplate reader uh, to determine nitrogen concentrations. We used linear mixed effect models and delta AIC model comparisons to identify our best fit models. Uh, we treated timing of season and grazing as, as fixed effects and plot nested in block as random effects and data were log transformed and we included an AR1 autocorrelation component. So we found that soil ammonium concentrations were 10 times greater than that of nitrate. Um, and this was to be expected given uh, due to the highly saturated and anaerobic nature of our coastal wetland soils. Um, our season long resin data represent uh, relative plant available nitrogen pools that are ionically bound to, uh, to soil surfaces and available to plants. So we found that early grazing had greater uh, ammonium availability across uh, all three years of the experiment, while in contrast, uh, late grazing reduced soil nitrate pools. And we saw no observed shift in peak timing with grazing treatments, just changes in concentrations. We also saw these late season drop-offs in inorganic concentrations on our resins. And this was uh, due to monthly peak uh, high tide flooding events that led to the infiltration of ionic seawater into the soil and the uh, loss uh, and stripping of accumulated ions on our resin strips. So to mitigate this problem, we used those interstitial, uh, sorry, intertidal resins in between uh, peak flooding events that had greater sensitivity to, uh, to our treatments uh, than the season long resins did. And we found that uh, early season, or sorry, early grazing increased both nitrate, ammonium and nitrate availability while late grazing just reduced ammonium in the soil. We also found that no grazing initially reduced nitrate, but then increased it in the final year. Um, however, this shift was likely due to uh, small overall concentrations of, um, of nitrate in the soils. Similarly, season advancement initially reduced uh, soil ammonium, but then increased it by the end of the experiment. Um, and it's possible that this was due to uh, initially increased uptake with plant growth but also warming temperatures that stimulated microbial production. We also saw that early grazing increased both uh, inorganic, so ammonium and nitrate, uh, as well as organic or uh, amino acid pools in free flowing soil poor water samples. And compared to other Arctic tundra soils, uh, we had low amino acid concentrations. Um, however, because we know that sedges can utilize amino acids as nitrogen sources, these low concentrations suggest high uptake and use by plants over the entire duration of the season. We also found that advanced growing seasons resulted in larger uh, soil ammonium pools. However, this response was significantly less than that of early grazing, despite a similar shift in timing. So across all three years of our experiment, early grazing increased both uh, inorganic and organic nitrogen pools for both soil absorbed and soil poor water. While season advancement increased ammo uh, ammonium pools, but this effect was less than that of grazing despite a similar shift in mismatch. We also found that late grazing reduced inorganic nitrogen pools while no grazing had delayed effects. And we found no treatment effects on nitrogen mineralization rates, suggesting that changes in soil nitrogen pools were driven by differences in nitrogen uptake uh, and immobilization. So in general, a three week advancement of the uh, or no mismatch in the growing season um, and plants, or sorry, and herbivores resulted in larger uh, soil ammonium pools. While delayed goose arrival in greater mismatch uh, of three to six weeks uh, resulted in reductions of soil ammonium or soil nitrate. 
and changes in mismatch had no measurable effect on the organic nitrogen pool or nitrogen mineralization rates. So in summary, uh, early grazing increased soil nitrogen uh, for both inorganic and organic pools um, for all measurements. While season advancement also increased inorganic nitrogen, uh, this was less than grazing despite a similar shift in timing. And because we saw greater biomass accumulation with late and no grazing in our experiment, uh, this also translated into increased nitrogen demand and uptake. And although early grazing uh, increased standing nitrogen pools and nitrogen is limiting in our system, uh, greater labile nitrogen could result in potential loss from the system. Uh, so another paper by Dr. Kathy Kelsey investigated the uh, effect of mismatch on greenhouse gas fluxes in our experiment. She found that early grazing by geese resulted in net uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, for net ecosystem exchange, um, uh, methane, as well as N2O, um, including shifting our soils from a net carbon sink uh, to a net carbon source. And while there was a slight increase in N2O fluxes, uh, these effects, uh, sorry, these emissions were, were pretty marginal uh, in size, which suggests that N2O is not, not likely a significant pathway of nitrogen loss from our system. It is possible that goose species may be an important source of nitrogen. Um, as we saw with early arrival and early grazing, uh, it reduced uh, above ground biomass and resulted in earlier trampling of feces into the soil. Uh, stable isotope data that we collected suggests that foliar nitrogen is enriched with a sig uh, an isotopic signature similar to that found in goose feces. Um, and these signatures suggest some degree of nitrogen exchange between geese and their forage uh, which could be important in this nitrogen limited environment. Uh, however, the pathway of this mechanism is still unknown and requires further investigation. So to summarize, our findings support our first two hypotheses because both timing of grazing and timing of season affect soil nitrogen availability. However, we failed to accept our third hypothesis because we did not see interactive effects between season and goose grazing. We also did not see shifts in timing of peak nitrogen availability and just saw changes in the relative concentrations of these uh, nitrogen pools. And our findings suggest that uh, soil nitrogen is highly dependent on the timing of these biotic interactions. So now I'm going to talk about my third dissertation chapter, which focused on how uh, changes in herbivory patterns uh, between geese and vegetation uh, affects plant communities. Uh, and this manuscript was recently submitted to the Journal of Vegetation Science and is currently in peer review. So warmer temperatures are altering plant communities because certain functional groups uh, respond more positively to warming than others. For example, we're currently seeing a rapid expansion of Arctic shrubs into previously unoccupied tundra communities. Uh, and these positive growth responses in some species can result in a reduction of species diversity and evenness. And changes in community structure can have consequences for ecosystem processes and abiotic conditions uh, like albedo and snow deposition. Um, warming is also altering the distribution and abundances of migratory herbivores across Arctic landscapes. Uh, some migratory species are following retreating thermal gradients uh, while others are following changes in resource availability on the landscape. Uh, we're also seeing a shift of species into novel habitats, uh, which are likely to result in new suites of uh, biotic interactions. As we've seen, uh, grazing by herbivores can alter vegetation communities through increased grazing pressure, feces, and trampling. And while herbivory removes biomass, it can also stimulate uh, growth resulting in positive growth responses in some plant species adapted to grazing. Um, and also through uh, increased light availability and reduced interspecific competition. And previous work has found that herbivores can mediate effects of warming uh, and provide community stability and ecological resilience to climate driven change. So low elevation Arctic coastal ecosystems are particularly vulnerable to climate driven increases in global sea level. Uh, warmer winter temperatures are reducing the extent of shorefast sea ice, 
that normally buffer coastlines from storm surge events. And these flooding events result in increased sedimentation and salinization and can occur up to 35 kilometers inland. Um, and these processes are likely to shift both plant communities and goose herbivores uh, further inland. The Yukon Delta is particularly vulnerable to coastal erosion um, and these increasing storm events. Um, previous work by Tori Jorgensen um, has found that uh, some areas in the Yukon Delta have experienced losses of a quarter to half mile of coastline over the past half century. Uh, these images here are satellite imagery from uh, the lower one from 1965. And in 2007, we've seen um, almost 800 meter reduction in coastline um, along the coastal margin. So this is a significant loss of critical habitat in these coastal wetlands. Uh, this, these are some photos uh, that I, I took from, uh, that I, let, uh, I captured using a time-lapse camera at our field site over winter after we had left. Um, I just wanna note this is in late October in 2016 at 10, 10 in the morning. And um, an hour later, we see the Bering Sea has spilled onto, uh, onto some of the lower beaches um, along the shore here. Two hours later, uh, we see complete inundation of all terrestrial surfaces. Three hours later, we see total submersion of all vegetation. And then seven hours later, we see a uh, recession of these flooding events of, of, of the ocean and sea level. Um, so these are really significant and, and pretty uh, dynamic processes that are occurring uh, in, in the outer, outer fringe of the Delta. So future climate scenarios suggest that rising sea levels will force both plant communities and goose herbivores further inland. And if coastal erosion and flooding result in the loss of primary uh, carex grazing lawns, uh, the adjacent coastal communities will likely experience uh, a new suite of trophic interactions between plants and herbivores in adjacent areas. So the, the question for this experiment was, how do changing herbivory patterns uh, changes in warming and interactions between the two affect plant community diversity and composition by functional groups. Now, while Carrick's grazing lawns are critical forage habitat for migratory geese, uh, these lawns comprise less than 1% of the active uh, coastal floodplain. And adjacent coastal terrace communities are also important foraging habitat uh, in brooding areas for uh, migratory goose populations. So we expanded uh, the focus of this experiment to the three adjacent coastal terraces seen here uh, near the mouth of the Tatakuk River. Um, the terraces encompass about 44% of the active, uh, the active floodplain, and they increase in elevation from sea level out here on, uh, near the coast to about two meters in elevation, about six kilometers further inland. And these terraces are the site of long-term 20-year vegetation monitoring plots conducted by Tori Jorgensen and his collaborators. So each of the three coastal terraces is dominated by a particular uh, plant community ecotype. On terrace one or T1, we have brackish levee moisture meadows that are dominated by beach grasses and forbs and sedges. On terrace two or T2, we have saline wet meadows that are dominated by common sedges and forbs. And on terrace three, the most inland terrace, um, we have uh, brackish wet sedge shrub meadows uh, with inland sedges and dwarf shrubs. Um, there's also a, cold, uh, a soil moisture gradient um, with denser, more mineral soils occurring near the coast and more saturated, more organic soils found further inland. Uh, for this experiment, we conducted a two-year manipulative experiment where we simulated both warming and grazing uh, and not timing of, of, of season advancement. This was a warming treatment. And we used these uh, plexiglass open top chambers to passively warm our plots about one to two degrees Celsius um, uh, to stimulate uh, plant productivity. We also simulated goose herbivory pre pressure by manu manually clipping plots at three week intervals. Um, grazing intensity and timing were derived from go other goose observation studies uh, conducted in the area. And treatments were applied to eight different blocks across the three different terrace communities. And this is an example of an experimental block depicting our experimental treatments with our top plots here receiving the warming treatment and the bottom plots receiving the ambient treatment. And then the plots on the left uh, uh, received simulated goose herbivory while the plots on the right uh, were left unclipped. 
So in each of these plots, we collected monthly percent cover measurements uh, with a one by one square, um, from which we were able to derive species richness, a species evenness, and Shannon diversity indices. Uh, and we identified all vegetation uh, by functional group. Uh, we used uh, ANOVAs to compare differences between treatments. Um, and then we also ran NMDS multivariate analyses to assess changes in community composition. So across all three terraces, both grazing and warming, generally increased species diversity or community diversity for all measurements. Um, Warming had a slightly greater increase in species richness compared to grazing. However, grazing also increased evenness and Shannon diversity across all, all three communities. Um, grazing and warming also interacted to increase evenness or to synergistically increase Shannon diversity greater than either treatment alone. Um, while we saw uh, overall grazing and warming effects across all communities, these trends were different once we uh, investigated uh, community differences at uh, diversity at the individual terrace level. Um, we did not see uh, the warming effect on richness at, uh, at the terrace community level, which suggests the importance of scale when investigating climate-driven effects. On T1, uh, we found that warming reduced evenness, likely due to increases by some species that responded more positively to warming uh, in the crowding of others. Uh, however, grazing was able to reverse these warming effects and maintain both evenness and diversity with climate-driven disturbance. On T3, or most inland terrace, uh, both grazing and warming interacted to increase species richness about 14% greater, greater than either of those effects alone. While on terrace two, uh, we have, saw no measurable effects on community diver to diver diversity. Our NMDS results found that grazing but not warming affected community composition, where grazing increased forbs on T1 and T2 and uh, decreased grasses on, on, these, uh, on these two terraces, while on T3, grazing reduced sedges but increased standing dead biomass further inland. And another way to think about this is uh, if geese move inland, they're likely to do decrease grasses and increase forbs in the most coastal terraces, but decrease uh, sedge forage uh, and increase standing dead on the most inland terrace. So we found that both grazing and warming increased diversity across all communities. Um, and it's important because maintaining or increasing community diversity could help buffer ecosystems through the port what is known as the portfolio effect, where diversification of species with varying phenology and life history traits can provide ecological resiliency to climate-driven disturbances. Uh, we also found that not all species within functional groups had the same response to treatments, which may complicate future predictions of, 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 uh, of these communities. And community responses to climate-driven warming and grazing are likely gonna be very sp site-specific and highly dependent on local species composition and abiotic conditions. So on T1, our most coastal terrace, uh, this terrace displayed the greatest degree of response to grazing and our warming treatments. Um, and of all three terraces, it had the, the driest soils and the lowest organic content. And lower soil moistures are likely to be less resilient to disturbance and more responsive to shifts in temperature because drier soils respond more quickly to thermal changes uh, compared to moist, saturated soils. T1 is also the terrace that's most vulnerable to higher sea levels and increased coastal erosion which poses the greatest risk to Pacific Black Brant and waterfowl net nesting near, coastal, near the coast. Comparatively, uh, the middle terrace, T2, had no uh, community, community diversity responses to grazing and warming. Uh, T2 also had the highest diversity measurements of richness and evenness, and is the community that has historically received a greater grazing intensity. And it's possible that the existing community uh, heterogeneity an adapted response to goose or vivary may have provided some ecological resilience to disturbance. Um, and we also found that some forb species found on both T1 and T2, um, like there's some overlap of these species, but generally they're more abundant on T1. Um, but with grazing, uh, grazing significantly increased the abundance of these forbs on T2, um, greater than that on T1, which suggests that increased grazing pressure may facilitate inland shifts of certain coastal species and increase uh, uh, disturbance-driven colonization. 
On T3, our most inland uh, terrace, we found that grazing but not warming increased community diversity and changed functional group composition. Uh, T3 reduced uh, sedge cover um, and through the remo removal of taller living vegetation exposed uh, increasing uh, dead and organic material, which suggests that geese will reduce forage avail availability for themselves if they move further inland. T3 is also the terrace with the lowest density of geese and likely has fewer plant species adapted to grazing. Um, and we also observed delayed increases in some diversity measurements at the end of the growing season. Uh, and it's possible that colder soils in proximity to permafrost may have slowed the plant growth response to our disturbance treatments. So while brant typically migrate to southern latitudes in the fall, uh, some birds are already altering their migration patterns. Uh, in the fall, Brant stage in Cold Bay, Alaska at Eisenbeck Lagoon National Wildlife Refuge uh, and wait to catch the autumn storms for their long migration south back to Mexico in the winter. However, warmer winter conditions are resulting in greater numbers of Brant overwintering in the Aleutians instead of migrating all the way to Mexico. And by shortening their migration distance, it's possible that some of these individuals may arrive on the, on the breeding grounds earlier or join other Brant populations on the North Slope and the Arctic Coastal Plain. Um, this is important because many native uh, Chupik people in the Delta still rely on subsistence hunting and gathering as a way of life. And their tr uh, cultural traditions span thousands of years in the Yukon Delta. And as we've seen, changes in goose abundancies will have overall ecosystem consequences, but shifts in migra migration patterns and behaviors will directly impact people uh, that, um, that rely on these birds along the flyway. So in conclusion, from my uh, summary of our first, my first chapter, we found that timing and grazing by migratory herbivores has a greater impact on, on grazing lawns than a similar shift in the timing of the growing season. Uh, we saw that early grazing reduced forage availability while late, uh, late or no grazing resulted in greater above ground and below ground biomass. Uh, we saw that late grazing had a similar shift in timing in response to season advancement. Um, and while some impacts of phenological mismatch are immediate, uh, others uh, might be difficult to predict because they can take years to respond. We found that early grazing increases uh, both inorganic and organic soil nitrogen pools while late grazing de decreases nitrogen availability. Um, in earlier springs increase organic nitrogen, but this was less than the effect of early grazing. And while geese can increase nitrogen pools, it's unclear how goose species might contribute as potential nitrogen sources. And um, fluxes and isotopic data suggest that there may be some nitrogen recycling between geese and their forage species. Now, early and late grazing generally had opposing effects on forage resources, where early grazing reduced overall forage availability, but maintained higher forage quality, uh, while late grazing resulted in greater forage availability, but lower forage quality. Um, early grazing also increased nitrogen pools, but resulted in shifting systems from a carbon sink to a carbon source, while late grazing reduced nitrogen pools, but resulted in greater carbon uptake and uh, greater carbon storage. And depending on either timing of either late or delayed arrival, herbivores have the potential to alter ecosystem processes uh, with mismatch and shifts in their timing. And from chapter three, we found that both grazing and warming increased diversity across communities, uh, although grazing had a stronger in influence on community composition compared to warming. Uh, increasing forbs and decreasing grasses in the most coastal communities and decreasing sedge forage on the most inland community. And lastly, because these community level responses can vary at both site and ecosystem levels, our findings highlight the importance of using manipulative field experiments to investigate climate driven impacts at multiple spatial scales. So climate driven phenological mismatch between plants and migratory herbivores has the potential to influence forage availability, uh, impact biogeochemical processes and alter plant communities. And how species interact with climate to affect co coastal ecosystems will be dependent on the strength of both abiotic and biotic factors. Uh, in general, shifts in the timing of grazing or the presence of herbivores or herbivory had greater effects um, than similar changes in season advancement or warming. 
And our findings suggest that factors influencing the timing of long distance migration in the wintering grounds can have ecosystem consequences in the Arctic. Uh, be and because many of these effects are not straightforward or predictable outcomes, it also highlights the importance of using experiments to investigate these climate drivers. Uh, coastal west wetland ecosystems are some of the most threatened in the world, and they provide critical ecosystem services like maintaining water quality, uh, providing carbon storage, and providing critical habitat for countless species. And in the Yukon Delta, coastal regions are expected to experience warmer, earlier growing conditions, which will place significant pressure on plant herbivore interactions. Um, and these effects can threaten, threaten critical goose resources and may compromise the ability of these systems to support historic goose abundances. To the best of our knowledge, this experiment is the first uh, experimental manipulation of phenological mismatch between plants and herbivores. And based on our findings, we highlight the importance of investigating phenology and the timing of biotic interactions to better understand the effects of climate-driven changes in other global systems. The Yukon Delta is one of the last largely intact and fully functional ecosystems left in North America with the more important ecological te teleconnections uh, to the rest of the globe. And Alaska is the only place in this country that's in the Arctic, which makes it an incredibly important place to understand changes in polar regions. Um, Yukon Delta is also home to over 35 different Chupik villages and thousands of people who are intimately connected to and dependent on this landscape. And as vast and as wild as the Yukon Delta is, it's still highly vulnerable to climate-driven changes in a rapidly warming future. With that, I'd like to leave you with a haiku. Um, with warmer winters, geese graze their grasses early. Timing matters most. I'd like to thank my dissertation committee, um, Andrew Kolmatiski, uh, Josh Leffler, Kari Veblen, and Jeff Welker. Um, I'd like to thank my research collaborators, uh, Dr. Kathy Kelsey and Joel Schmutz. And I'd like to thank my research mentors, uh, Nancy Huntley, uh, Sasha Reed, and Colin Tucker, as well as the USU Climate Adaptation Science faculty. This work would not have been possible without the help of our incredible Tataka Oak field crews. Um, I'd like to thank Hope Braithwaite, Lindsay Carlson, Thomas DeMasters, John Ferguson, Kathy Kelsey, Robert Hicks, Martin Holdridge, Kai Linaway, and Steph Walden. Um, I also thank an army of USU technicians who helped process thousands of samples in the lab. I'm indebted to the folks at CPS Polar, Polar Field Services for their logistical field as assistance at the start of our field seasons. Um, this was a massive uh, endeavor and um, field campaign. And I especially thank Larry and Matt for their indispensable field wisdom. I would like to say Kliana to the people of Chivak for welcoming, welcoming me into their homes and sharing their saunas and honoring me as a special guest at their traditional uh, celebrations um, and including me as part of their community for many years. Uh, I'd like to say special thanks to Elias Friday and Mike Machian for sharing their traditional Chupik knowledge and for looking out for us during our summers in the Delta. I thank my friends far and wide who have supported me over the years, as well as the numerous generations of grad students and faculty and community members who've made Logan a rich and fulfilling place to call home. I'd like to thank my family, uh, Richard, Gail, Morgan, Jeremy, and Sawyer for encouraging me to follow my passions and to, uh, to live out my dreams. And I'm deeply indebted to Eric and Nick and Mark and Desiree for your never ending wisdom, your ceaseless inspiration and support in the ways that matter most. And lastly, I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. Karen Beard for a 13 year working relationship that has spanned from the tropics to the Arctic. Thank you for this life changing opportunity and, and for entrusting me with this massive logistical undertaking. And now my watch has ended. I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Hey, Ryan. Ryan. Yeah. It's Mark here. Hey, Mark. Can't, can't be too long because I got to run to class, but okay. a quick question for you. You know, 
you kind of gave a technical analysis, but what were the people, like how long have the people been living in that area? And you know, what was their take on it from some more heuristic point of view? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so the Chupic people out there have been in this part of the Delta for probably 10,000 years. And um, talking with a lot of the elders in the community and they have these oral traditions and stories that tell, talking about different periods and different periods of climate uh, in the Delta that they've seen over many, many, many generations. And um, during our time there, this, the, the changes that they were seeing in this part of the Delta uh, were changes that they had never seen in this part of the world before. Yeah, but was that, was that vegetation or both uh, that and uh, you know, the, the birds? Um, it was mostly like, I, like, like ice cover um, and sea ice extent 